Are you ready for a trip into space and time? We are now going to do one. We are going to the very far end of our planet. We are going to Hobart, Tasmania, where it is already December 2. It's already tomorrow in Tasmania. And we have Paul Davies. Hello, Paul. It's very nice to see you again. Hello from tomorrow. So, Paul, you are at the University of Tasmania, but you're about to leave. What were you doing in Tasmania? Celebrating the 65th birthday of Robert Del Burgo, who's a physicist I've known for many years, and we've had a conference on quantum field theory here with lots of distinguished people from all over the world. Quantum field theories. But that's not what I want to talk about with you, Paul. Uh, three years ago, when we met in Sydney, where you're now teaching, you gave me this book with a dedication from yourself, and you wrote the recipe to travel in time. Can you tell us about how to build a time machine? A few moments ago, you were showing a clip where if a plane was to travel uh, between two points on the Earth, then a very sensitive clock on the plane would be slightly out of step with a clock left on the ground. And the effect is even larger with spacecraft. So Einstein knew already in 1905 that motion could warp time, and later he discovered that gravitation could warp time. Uh, but these are both devices for traveling into the future, that is, uh, going forward in time. Uh, in principle, if you could travel fast enough to the speed of light or uh, get to a very strong gravitational field and then come back again, uh, you could go uh, hundreds or even thousands of years into the future. But I think what really fascinates people is the possibility of traveling backward in time. And that's a much tougher proposition. I think Einstein himself never liked the idea of going back in time, but his general theory of relativity, which is our most complete understanding of the nature of time, does not forbid it. In fact, in the late 1940s, Einstein's colleague at uh, the uh, Institute for Advanced Study in Princeton, Kurt Gödel, uh, produced a solution of Einstein's very own field equations that showed the possibility of backward in time travel. Now, it's true that this particular solution was rather unrealistic because it corresponded to a rotating universe, and we don't think the universe is rotating. But since then, uh, physicists have come up with a number of other ways in which one could uh, contrive to go back in time, that is, to create a loop in time, a causal loop and a time loop. And this opens up a Pandora's box of scary paradoxes. Okay, so Einstein himself made this possible, traveling into time. So, do you think this is really a possibility? Because physicists here at CERN were saying this is for the moment just speculation. But in your book you seem to yeah, say... Well, it's true. <laughs> that is true. It, it's true that this is highly speculative. Uh, the, the most favored way of going back in time is something called a wormhole in space. And a wormhole is like a, a shortcut between two points in space. Uh, for example, if we had uh, a wormhole uh, here in uh, Hobart, Tasmania, and uh, I jumped into it, then maybe I would come out on the other side of the galaxy. Uh, now, people might be familiar with this idea from the movie Contact. This was based on the novel written by Carl Sagan. And in the movie, uh, the actor jo Jodie Foster into a wormhole and comes out near the star Vega. Uh, so uh, this has entered science fiction. Sometimes people call these things stargates. Basically means a shortcut between two points in space. And certainly within Einstein's general theory of relativity, because space can be warped, it can be connected up in more than one way. So you can connect two points in space uh, by a very short distance and by a long distance. And then you can choose which route to take. Now, it turns out that if you can connect two points in space in this way, uh, then you can turn this into a time machine. Uh, so if you were to jump through the wormhole in one direction, you jump into the future. If you jump in the other direction, you go into the past. Now, we don't know that wormholes really exist in the universe. Uh, people ask me often, well, what is a wormhole? It sounds like a black hole. Is that true? Well, uh, it's partly true. If you fall into a black hole, you're on a one-way journey to nowhere. You can jump into a black hole, but you can't get out again. So it has an entrance, but not an exit. A wormhole would be like a black hole. It would be a, 
uh, an intense gravitational field, but it would have an exit too. So you could go in and come out somewhere else. And you could look right through it and see out the other side. Now, astronomers have looked to see if uh, there are any signs of such things out there in space. Uh, and so far, they haven't uh, discovered anything. So then the question arises, could we make a wormhole for ourselves? If we had uh, enough money, uh, enough technology, could we actually manufacture such a thing? Uh, and that's a tricky problem, because you certainly can't take out a, a pair of scissors and, and slice into space-time and uh, start cutting and pasting. Uh, that isn't allowed. But uh, I believe at the uh, microscopic level, if you get to a size much smaller than the experiments they do at CERN, if you get to uh, 20 powers of 10, smaller than an atomic nucleus, uh, then uh, I, I believe, and a lot of theoretical physicists believe, that there are all sorts of wormholes spontaneously forming and disappearing again. We sometimes call that space-time foam. So if we could devise a means, and I have no real idea how, uh, of gaining control over this space-time foam, we could perhaps inflate one of these wormholes to uh, everyday Jodie Foster size uh, and then turn it into a time machine. If, suppose that wormholes were found and existed and black holes could be mastered technologically, I mean, how would a time machine cost? How much would it cost to build one? Uh, well, there's a, a flippant answer to this, which I sometimes give, which is that if we had a time machine, uh, then we could travel into the future and read off the various stock prices and come back uh, to the present and then invest our money wisely and then the time machine would pay for itself. <laughs> and That's this smart. is an example of one of, the, one of the paradoxes of time travel, is that once you start getting into these causal loops, uh, all sorts of problems open up. And, and some people think, well, this makes nonsense of the whole idea. Uh, the, the one that most science fiction writers focus on is the time traveler who goes back into the past and uh, changes something. For example, uh, in the uh, film Back to the Future, the Hollywood movie, uh, the time traveler gets sort of involved with his uh, mother's love life and thus, thus threatens his own existence. Uh, well, an even more drastic example, the time traveler goes back and shoots mother dead when she's a, a young girl. Then, uh, of course, if uh, the mother never grew up to give birth to the time traveler, then the time travel could never have happened. But if it didn't happen, then the mother would have grown up. So we get into these paradoxes. Uh, I don't think there is a fundamental problem there, uh, so long as you stick with consistent narratives. So uh, there's no problem about a time traveler going back and saving the life of a young girl who subsequently grows up to become the time traveler's mother. That hangs together self-consistently. So although time travel into the past is weird, I don't think it's genuinely paradoxical with those problems. But as far as the cost is concerned, well, uh, in our present state of knowledge, we have no real idea how to do this. But I must say the following. Uh, the Large Hadron Collider, which is currently being commissioned at CERN, uh, will, according to some alternative theories of gravitation, uh, just possibly create uh, microscopic black holes and wormholes uh, when it uh, uh, is commissioned in uh, two or three years' time. Uh, so I must emphasize this is not predicted by Einstein's uh, theory of relativity, but it is predicted by some alternative, uh, some extensions of that theory uh, that involve things like higher dimensions and brains and things like that we don't want to get into. So if these theories are right, it's just possible that within a few years, right there at CERN, you will be manufacturing microscopic wormholes. And then uh, one could conceive of experiments, for example, uh, not a human being going through them, these would be subatomic wormholes, but it's not inconceivable that some subatomic particles could loop around, uh, traverse through these wormholes, and that the effect of time travel might just show up in the way these particles scatter. Now, it's a bit of a long shot, but it just shows that we may not be too far off realizing uh, time travel at the subatomic level. At the subatomic scale. And you just answered one of the questions we had from our email, that is, will the LHC create black holes or wormholes? I think you have a plane to catch, Paul. And I thank you very, very much for being with us, uh, even though for a short time. And I particularly thank the University of Tasmania, Hobart, for making this uh, video conference possible with the other end of the world. Thank you, Paul. Bye-bye. It's been my pleasure. Thank you for inviting me. Goodbye. <laughs>